when the waiver came up again in December uh, of last year, uh, he was still getting the advice from the Pentagon, from the State Department. Don't touch the city of Jerusalem. It's a barrel of explosives. When you touch it, it might blow in your face. The Arab street will be in flames because of that decision. God heard the prayers of millions of people and he moved on the heart of our president. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. There is no city on the face of the earth the equal of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a, a different city from all the cities of the world. Jerusalem is where God Almighty has placed his name. So much of what we consider human rights and the equality of man created in God's image, this all flowed from this city. It's a very dense and concentrated city. Everybody has a claim in Jerusalem. A struggle over Jerusalem is the natural process of history until Messiah comes. It's an important city to almost four billion people. It's a very high level of religion concentrated here from Jewish, Christian, and Islamic side. Jerusalem is a very complex and difficult place to live and to work and to understand. Jerusalem for me is the heart of the universe. It must be understood that the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem have belonged to the Jewish people since the book of Genesis. It's an ancient tradition that is connecting the Jewish people to the city. This is where we were forged as a nation. God Almighty gave the land of Israel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. King David made it their capital 3,000 years ago. The Jewish people lost Jerusalem when the Romans took it in the year 70. For 2,000 years, we were away. What kept us together is Jerusalem, is the prayers for Jerusalem, is the yearning to Jerusalem. We never lost our attachment to Jerusalem. Our claim to Jerusalem survived. Every single important event in my life, my personal life and my professional life were connected to the city. Uh, when my husband proposed and uh, we decided to get married, the first thing we did was to go to the Western Wall and pray. I went to Temple Mount to express my gratitude. When I gave birth, it was on Mount Scarpus. We have already found British documents from the year 1864, which establish that at that time, the Jews had recovered their majority in Jerusalem. Cairo was an Arab city. Damascus was an Arab city. Riyadh was an Arab city. Jerusalem was already a Jewish city. There are many things Israelis debate on. There is just one thing they don't debate on. No Israeli will ever replace his capital city. Jerusalem is something that every Israeli is connected to. The city of Jerusalem is of incredible importance for Christians all around the world. The church was born in Jerusalem. The life of Jesus Christ, he was in Jerusalem, he went to the temple. Here in Jerusalem, he died. Here in Jerusalem, he rose from the dead. Jerusalem is where Jesus Christ is going to set up his eternal kingdom that shall never end. <laughs> 
I remember it until today. I came to Jerusalem and as we entered the city, I had this incredible strange feeling. It says, now you have arrived home. There's no place where the Word of God comes alive uh, so much than here where you walk where the kings of Israel, the patriarchs, the prophets, uh, Jesus and the apostles here in the land where it all happened. And the word just uh, seems to walk along with you here, speaking to you in ways. The roots of our Christian faith, they are right here in the city of Jerusalem. In Islam, the true holy city, the holiest city is Mecca. And secondly, Medina, both of which are located in Saudi Arabia. The adoption of Jerusalem by the Muslims is very artificial one because there is no mention of it whatsoever. It's mentioned 669 in our Bible. The Prophet Muhammad appointed Jerusalem as the direction of prayer. But then he changed the direction of Muslim prayers towards Mecca. And when Muslims pray on Temple Mount, they put their backs to where the Holy Temple was. In the Quran, there is a sentence. Muhammad's mythical night journey on this horse uh, to the outermost mosque, as the Quran puts it. Al-Aqsa means in Arabic, the farthest away. 200 years after the death of the Prophet. The Umayyads, a dynasty of Muslims that were in control in Damascus, they lost control of Mecca and the worship there uh, around the black box. So they had to elevate and raise the importance of Jerusalem. The king built a mosque in Jerusalem, which he called Al-Aqsa. And now you can read history in reverse. Since in the Quran, it's, it said that the Prophet went to Al-Aqsa Mosque, here it is. The Palestinians have lived under the delusion that the land of Israel somehow belongs to them, as does the city of Jerusalem, which is historically utter nonsense. It was never the capital of some separate Arab state here in the region, all the centuries of uh, Arabs living here. When it was in their hands, it was never the capital, not only of, of a state, or of a kingdom. It was not even the capital of a district. The Palestinians have had claims to Jerusalem only since 1967, where Israel liberated the city and united it. And it was actually an attempt to rob the Jews of their rightful place here. The Palestinians have absolutely no claim to Jerusalem as the capital of a future Palestinian state. Absolutely none. Israel is now 70 years old, and yet we're still having this battle over what city is its capital. Even though the state was declared in Tel Aviv. Our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, has decided to move the parliament, the Israeli Supreme Court, the government offices, everything to Jerusalem in one day. According to international law, and by the right of self-determination, every nation has the right to designate its, its capital. For 70 years now, the world has denied Israel this uh, right. <laughs> There was the idea of internationalization from the 1947 UN partition plan. The Islamic world they was, was not willing to compromise at all on the city of Jerusalem. The Palestinians like to raise it from time to time because they want to use the internationalization proposal as a lever to pull Jerusalem away from Israel. Different countries made reference to it as still being active and alive. And therefore, countries refrained from recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Today, if the uh, Arab side, in particular the Palestinian side, comes forward and says, oh, we made a mistake, now we accept the partition plan. Well, I'm sorry, they're a little late for that. 
There's also this excuse of uh, even-handedness and neutrality that since there's a dispute over the city, we can't take one side or the other, so we can't move our embassies here. The Americans are here at the Grand Street location, the consulate here. There's also Britain and France and Sweden and Belgium and Spain and Turkey, several other countries that have their primary diplomatic mission to the Palestinian authorities here in Jerusalem, some in West Jerusalem, and yet these same nations say that you can't have your main diplomatic mission, your embassy to Israel here in this city. It's unfair. The reason why the international community uh, refused to accept Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel had mainly to do with the fear of the Arab world. They've been intimidated by these threats that the whole region is going to uh, blow up. That's what scholars call demitude, an attitude where you're subservient to uh, Islam and, and make decisions based on how uh, they feel about it and whether you offend them. And that's not right for democratic nations to do that. This should not be in the way of anyone recognizing Jerusalem for what it is, the capital of the Jewish people. Well, in July 1980, the Knesset made a decision. They passed a law which was called the Jerusalem Law. Israel was always the capital of the Jewish people, but not formally on the law books of Israel. And when that law was passed, the world went crazy. The Arab League decided every nation that recognizes the status of Jerusalem by keeping their embassy there or moving their embassy to Jerusalem, we will cut off their oil supply. There were 12 Latin American countries here at the time, plus Holland from Europe. So it just took a few weeks until all the embassies that were here in Jerusalem closed their doors and relocated to Tel Aviv. Jerusalem was empty of international representation. Not one nation in the whole world was willing to stand with the 3,000-year-old Jewish claim and connection to this city. Christian leaders that were here, they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in 1980, that they gathered together, they said, now is the time for Christians to make a bold move and open an international Christian embassy as an act of comfort and solidarity with Israel and the Jewish people. We wanted to offer practical aid. To show them there are millions of Bible-believing Christians around the world that stand with God's promises regarding Israel. Menachem Begin, the prime minister at the time, was very excited about Christians opening an embassy in Jerusalem. Teddy Kollek, the beloved mayor of Jerusalem, came to the opening of the embassy in September 1980 and called it one of the most moving days of his life. If we're not alone, there are people who stand with us. Things like the movement of an embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem don't happen automatically. This requires constant diplomatic work. Jerusalem has been a political hot potato in Washington uh, since the early 1980s. There has always been a body of people in the United States who have sought to see the United States recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and move the embassy. In 1995, it was the first time the Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, in almost 40 years. And they initiated what was known as the Jerusalem Embassy Act, which called on the president to move the embassy. Unless and until an American ambassador sits in Jerusalem, this matter will be misunderstood and misinterpreted. I actually helped co-draft the first version of that bill. In our bill, we said, number one, recognize Jerusalem as the capital. Number two, move the ambassador there immediately. And number three, then worry about building a prestigious and secure embassy building. It was very important for our relations with uh, the 
Americans. The Clinton administration was threatening a veto. They said, look, we've got relations with all these Arab and Muslim countries to, to worry about, so we shouldn't do that. The Senate would have uh, been challenged to override a presidential veto by a two-thirds majority. We needed at least 67 senators. We were working towards that number. Couldn't quite get there until 10 Democrats came along at the leading of Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat from California. She said, I have 10 uh, Democratic senators so that you have uh, more than the 67 you need to override a potential veto, but you have to add the uh, waiver authority so that the president can put this off if he thinks in, in national security interests. The intent of this move from the start was to gut the bill. It, it, uh, it defanged it. The bill no longer had any real teeth. President Clinton, President Bush, and President Obama all promised when they were running for office to move the embassy. Every president since 1995 has sought a waiver which would allow him to get out of having to do it. The enemies of Israel discovered they could not defeat the Jewish state in warfare, and they turned to diplomacy as their weapon of war. Palestinian leadership under Yasser Arafat began with this strange argument. There never was a temple in Jerusalem, not a temple of Solomon, not a second temple, nothing. It wasn't fake news, it was fake history. The international community is led by a gang of 10 horned dictators in the United Nations. A Palestinian ambassador can put down a proposal. We should not allow Israel to get Jerusalem as its capital. And let's pass a resolution to that effect. Well, within a couple of hours, the Arab League countries take an internal decision. And then they go to the next level, which are the Islamic countries at the UN. That means Pakistan, Indonesia, Malaysia, join the group. Now, at that point, they go for the next level which is called the NAM countries, non-aligned movement, something that was established back in 1955 as a coalition of countries. And once the NAM countries automatically agree to the decisions made by the Islamic and Arab states, you now have about 140 countries in the UN. That's a clear majority of UN members and with that kind of majority, you can adopt any resolution. You could adopt a resolution that says the earth is flat. There was the UN Security Council Resolution 2334, passed in 2016 with uh, President Obama abstaining on this vote. That Jerusalem is not Jewish, it's Palestinian. Jews cannot build here. The Jewish people do not occupy the land of Israel. They own the land of Israel. UNESCO votes and other propaganda efforts of the Palestinians. That there is a Muslim connection to the Temple Mount, but they're erasing the Jewish connection and the Christian connection. To deny the Jewish connection to Israel and Jerusalem is to deny the rising of the sun in the east. And the shameful uh, event in world history is that the Christian ambassadors of Europe voted for that resolution in UNESCO, although they betrayed their own history. Israel is doing an incredible job to safeguard the holy places here on this land. This is a place where every person from all around the world can feel comfortable to practice his connection to God. The Christian Embassy is organizing every year the, the largest annual tourist event here in Israel, the Feast of Tabernacle. Christians from sometimes nearly a hundred countries of the world coming to Israel. They can visit all the sites. We can come and worship Jesus as we see fit. It has been a tremendous example of Jews recognizing Christian rights to worship, pray, 
demonstrate even, and be in Jerusalem. If we made the mistake and we lost our nerve, or if our prime minister wanted to get a good editorial in the New York Times and therefore conceded the old city of Jerusalem, well, the next day, those holy sites would be threatened. And we already had a taste of this because as a result of the Oslo agreements that were signed during the Clinton administration, Israel agreed that Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus, be part of the territory of the Palestinian Authority. They allowed uh, the uh, terrorists from Fatah and Hamas to go in and desecrate the Church of uh, the Nativity in Bethlehem. They took the uh, Christian clergy hostage. They uh, ransacked the church. It was Israeli sappers who went in and defused all these bombs that the, these Palestinian terrorists had set, and the, the Palestinian Authority all the time saying, we are the, you know, the uh, true guardians of the mosques, minarets, and churches of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Well, I think it's useful to go back to what happened in 1948, when the Jordanians invaded Jerusalem the systematic destruction of ancient synagogues and study halls in Jerusalem. Precious old holy sites were simply flattened. They were destroyed. I wouldn't trust the Palestinian leadership with the religious sites of mankind uh, any more than I'd rely on them at the United Nations. The U.S. branch of the Christian Embassy uh, has been very active on the Jerusalem Embassy issue over the last couple years. The American branch of the International Christian Embassy, led by Susan Michael, lobbied both uh, candidates before the election. They sent the statements, petitions, to both the uh, Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign. Hillary Clinton remained silent. There was no response, but very quickly, within a few days, we received a response from the camp around uh, Donald Trump. Said, yes, we're going to do it. They even added to our five points ways to stand with Israel and put out a public statement on it. When President Trump first came into office, in uh, January of, of 2017. Uh, come May, it was the first time that the waiver came up. He had to decide whether to sign the waiver uh, of moving the embassy to Jerusalem or not uh, that's contained in the uh, Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. It was my pleasure to go to the White House with Diana to have dinner with President Trump to discuss the matter of America recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And I said to the president, God does not care what other nations think. He does not care what they want. When you recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, you and President Truman will be celebrated in history for a thousand years as defenders of Israel. When the waiver came up again in December uh, of last year, uh, he was still getting the advice from the Pentagon, from the State Department. Don't touch the city of Jerusalem. It's a barrel of explosives. When you touch it, it might blow in your face. The Arab street will be in flames because of that decision. God heard the prayers of millions of people, and he moved on the heart of our president. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. While previous presidents have made this a major campaign promise, they failed to deliver. The first one who finally fulfilled the law and did it was President Donald Trump. He put his foot down. He said, I made a promise. I'm going to stand by it. We're doing it now, gentlemen. We were cheering and we said, yes, it's happening finally. Jerusalem is going to be recognized. And in just a few days, this is going to become the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. History is being made here. There'll be a large delegation from the Trump administration, about 40 members of Congress from the House and Senate, many other Jewish and Christian leaders who are going to come and help dedicate this as the new Embassy of America in Jerusalem. 
and it's uh, being timed for the 70th anniversary of Israel, May 14th, as a sort of birthday gift to Israel on its 70th birthday. It's sending a clear message to the enemies of Israel that our two nations are inseparable. And as an American, I was quite proud that this was happening. For many years, there was a misconception of how Jerusalem should be in, as, in its final status. Today, it's very clear, it will always be Israel's capital. The game is up. It's not going to be the same again to continue to vote uh, on these uh, temple denial resolutions, all the other things at UNESCO that the Palestinians are doing to try and undermine Israel's historic claim and connection to the land and to the city. Now, Jerusalem will remain permanently part of Israel, full stop. President Trump is going to go down history as the one who really put Jerusalem in the rightful owner. I think he will be some kind of Cyrus in Jewish history who, against all odds, permitted the Jews to come back from the first exile in Babylonia and reconstruct Jerusalem. I do believe it opened a new season, a new time for the city of Jerusalem. And in a way, it's like a dream. You have to pinch yourself. How did this happen? And uh, we think that there's a divine hand behind it. America's recognition of Jerusalem has brought a great blessing to the people of Israel, which will bring God's blessing upon the United States of America. And now we are talking already about five nations that declare we want to follow the U.S. administration. Guatemala will in a few weeks from now open their embassy. The next country probably will be Romania. They are talking about it in Czech Republic, in Honduras. And we also know some African nations are considering moving their embassy here to Jerusalem. History will judge uh, the coming years as, as the years that people will have to choose to be on the right side of history. This move was also a symbol for all the Christians around the world that now is the time to visit this nation. When I walked the streets of Jerusalem, I felt a very special presence there. I have traveled the world, but always in Jerusalem do I feel like I've come home we can take even from the words of Jesus that Jerusalem back in Jewish hands, the closer it comes to meeting its ultimate destiny and the closer Israel comes to meeting her redemptive destiny in God. The foundations of the future of the world are in Jerusalem. Washington DC, Rome, Berlin, Paris will all be forgotten in the world tomorrow. But Jerusalem lives forever. Jerusalem lives. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.